Sometimes the joy, and by joy I of course mean horror, of social media is that it's a constant stream of people yelling into the void. Which means often you see things kind of disjointed and out of context, and you have to become like a forensic scientist, sort of passing the key terms from the post and then like reverse engineering it until you work out what they're actually talking about. I'll give you an example. This weekend I was scrolling through Tumblr, which is becoming something of like an internet ghost town at this stage. And this post came up on my dashboard that was like, if you still stand for poppy after this, you're a racist piece of shit. Having no other context for this, my first thought was uh, Poppy, like the, the weirdo musical artist Poppy. So I jumped on Twitter to see if anyone was talking about it and there was nothing. And like I racked my brains to try and find another Poppy, couldn't think of one. Anyway, like long story short, after digging uh, more than I care to admit, <laughs> I was hungover, I didn't have a lot else going on. Uh, I eventually worked out that this person was furious at a video game character. And not even, like, a well-known video game character. Like, a video game character from one of those visual novel, sort of choose-your-own-adventure-style mobile games that are constantly being pushed with insane ads that feature, like, an animated pregnant woman kissing a handsome doctor and the two options on the screen that you can choose from, uh, tell him your water's just broken or confess to assassinating the president. Which is how I realized that sometimes people actually download those games and that they're super invested in them. <laughs> I don't get served these ads as much anymore, but I feel like for a while there, they were every second ad, to the point where they were kind of a meme. There are subreddits and like commentary channels that are dedicated entirely to the insanity of these ads. So I thought we could think about the games themselves. I'm Alex. This is Pop Culture Boner, the podcast edition. And today, I'm thinking about the weird world of mobile choose-your-own-adventure games. Okay, so this is one of those episodes where when I started thinking about it, I was like, ah, this will be fine, like probably a little bit difficult to stretch out into a whole episode, but we'll see how we go. But then the more I clicked, the more I uncovered, and suddenly I ended up being completely overwhelmed in information about, like, gaming microtransactions, fandoms, pornography, and, like, interactive romance novels. Which is to say, I think we should just stop the internet now. It's reached its natural endpoint. No one needs this much access to information or entertainment. We should all just return to small cabins in the woods with like chickens or something. I don't know how small cabins in the woods work. I'm kidding, uh, sort of. Um, anyway, normally when I talk about popular culture, I'm talking about something that I kind of vaguely interact with in my normal life. Even stuff I don't love that much, like Fifty Shades of Grey, for example, it's not totally foreign to me. I have a bit of a frame of reference, I guess. This episode's going to be slightly different because I don't really know what the fuck is going on. (laughs) It's so far beyond the realms of being my wheelhouse that I had to spend a bunch of time rummaging through some fairly obscure blogs to work out what was going on with, like, language and story progression and game mechanics. I've probably ruined my YouTube algorithm for a bit, but, like, only about as much as that time I became really fixated on the concept of trap metal, so that only took me a couple of weeks to fix. It'll be fine. (laughs) Uh, I think this episode is going to be a little bit of me dragging you on a journey through something I want to get to the bottom of. (laughs) I thought we could take a look at where these games come from, what's involved in playing them, and why they've become so weirdly popular in some corners of the internet. It'll be an attempt at figuring out something that seems to have a really intense following, except instead of us all reaching a sense of understanding, we can all just progressively become more confused as we go. Let's get into it. (laughs) I realize, having given you that very long introduction, that perhaps not everyone's frame of reference is the same as mine. Perhaps you were not bombarded with cartoon ads for six months in 2008, and perhaps if you were, it has not stuck with you. So for the sake of clarity, for a period of time, particularly on Tumblr and Instagram, there were a series of game ads for these choose-your-own-adventure mobile games. 
They were extremely melodramatic, uh, to put it mildly. I know I was making fun in the intro, but I jumped on Facebook's ad library just to see if they were, like, as wacky as I remembered. And look, I wasn't far off. (laughs) In one of the ones I watched, a girl delivers cookies to her grandma. But when her grandma doesn't answer the door, your options on the ad are try the door or come back later. And the ad chooses try the door for you. And the protagonist goes inside the house and she hears a scream. She runs upstairs to help, only to find her grandma in, like, a full-blown dominatrix outfit taking a riding crop to a man in a banana costume. And your options are call your therapist or run away. (laughs) Which, incidentally, uh, are the two options that I'm tossing up at any given moment. So honestly, maybe it's, it's not that wild. But the ad ends with, which would you choose? The other ads are all in a similar vein, like people are pregnant, maids are caught in compromising positions with their wealthy employers, all that spicy romance novel stuff. One of the ones that really made me laugh was uh, Two Feuding Pregnant Women, where the text on the screen says, I should, and your choices are cry and run away or go into labor, as though you can just go into labor on command. That'd be a pretty good superpower. Anyway, the basic premise is that the choices you make will impact the outcome, allowing you to romance different characters have different experiences, and reach a different ending. This is probably not an unfamiliar concept to most of you. Wikipedia tells me that the earliest iteration of the game book, uh, you can't see me, I'm doing air quotes, was in the 1930s as a romance novel called Consider the Consequences! with an exclamation point, which was a really great title. Readers got to pick an ending to the novel that was most to their tastes. But I think readers in my age bracket, so that's like an older millennial age bracket, probably know game books as choose-your-own-adventure novels, an extremely popular series that sold like 250 million copies from 1976 to 1998, and it's kind of credited with popularizing that format. The concept has made its way into TV and film over the years in various iterations, The earliest I could remember was a Final Destination DVD release that let you see if you could get to the end without dying, but a good recent and very meta example was the Black Mirror episode Bandersnatch on Netflix, which let you navigate through the development of a choose-your-own-adventure style game, which eventually sends you mad. Which I guess is a, a good segue back into the actual gaming element of it. Technically, people use the term interactive fiction, to describe a software-based version of this storytelling format. Interactive fiction can have a graphic input, but part of its early appeal to programmers was the fact that it was able to navigate around the different types of graphics inputs being used across different operating systems by being text only. This meant that these types of games spread early across computing systems, and so they kind of have a base level of popularity that holds over today. But the big players in this mobile gaming space, uh, that includes Pixelberry, who own Choices, who are responsible for the ads that I mentioned earlier, and Pocket Gems, who released uh, Episode, which is the same thing, but with ads I didn't read out to you. (laughs) Um, Those developers seem to be drawing on the visual novel style of gameplay. Visual novels are a style of game that were popularized in Japan, They're basically a text-based story, but with a visual aid to go along with it. Most of the time, these images are static or feature minimal movement, uh, but sometimes you get like a video cutscene or something similar to help move the story along. Generally, from an aesthetic perspective, they're characterized by a static image that denotes the character speaking, and then a text box over the top that offers their character's dialogue, your own dialogue and inner monologue, and the choices that you can make. Some games incorporate puzzle solving or other interactive elements, but Japanese audiences tend to make a distinction between these type of games, which are called adventure games, and visual novels, which tend to only offer up text-based choices which move the narrative in one direction or another. Most of them center on some sort of drama, and they span over a number of genres, including science fiction, horror, and fantasy, but perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, given the first five minutes of this podcast, They tend to be largely romantic fiction, regardless of the other genres that they touch upon. There's also a lot of erotic content available. 
Some of it just involves the inclusion of a sex scene as one potential outcome, but a lot of them are just straight up pornography. Interestingly, a lot of this erotic content was the sort of thing that started to be picked up by Western audiences in the early 2000s. Even now, a lot of the visual novel-style games that are released into Western markets, particularly the US, come from game houses that focus on visual novels and dating sims that have that kind of erotic content available. And as with anime and manga, there's also a fairly large community of fan translators who are ready to put in the hard yards when media companies won't release internationally. So a lot of fan-made content, like visual novels that are actually fan works of other media, also often gets translated into English. So that's the genre kind of broadly. We've hit the what, but still not the why or the who. These visual novel style games have gained traction in the Western market in two kind of strange and disparate ways. They're popular in indie game development circles and on mobile apps. It's kind of hard to say why, because surprisingly little has been written about it that I could find. Um, I'm taking a stab here, so any gamers, sound off in the comments, I guess. Um, I'm kidding. I don't have a comment section. This is my podcast. (laughs) Anyway, the stab that I'm taking is that from an indie development perspective, the mechanics are pretty simple, but they allow you to have a really complex narrative. So as an independent developer with no budget, you can tell your fully fleshed out story set in deep space with aliens and gunfights, but you don't have to invest the budget or the time into building a body moving through deep space. You can just have a simple character and world design that's reasonably static and tells the same story. I think the same principle applies to mobile game development, albeit in a less kind of wholesome DIY kind of way. Mobile games need to be fairly simple because of the nature of the mobile environment. I'm going to throw out some marketing bullshit here because it used to be my job, and if I had to sit through 900 sales pitches about harnessing the power of mobile in millennial brand spaces or whatever, it might as well be for something. (laughs) Synergy. Anyway, while people do have their phones on them all the time, and will happily acknowledge doing so, The attention economy is such that they're not always using it as a primary source of entertainment. You might have their attention during a commute, but even then it's probably going to be divided between multiple apps. And when they're at home, it's just another screen between themselves and the TV or the laptop or whatever they're using. I'm assuming there's probably also some limits to the complexity of the types of games you can build for a mobile system, But I'm not a scientist, and when I tried to read more about this, I, like, blacked out for a second. So, um, point is, visual novels would be a pretty cheap way to develop reasonably complex and engaging content in a mobile environment. Obviously, indie game developers and mobile gaming aren't mutually exclusive, but if you compare the visual novel output of an independent games developer like Christine Love, for example, who made Analog, a hate story for PC in 2012, to something from mobile studio Pixelberry's Many Choices narratives, the content is extremely different. Analog is a sci-fi work exploring themes of transhumanism, loneliness, history, and identity. Uh, Pixelberry's high school story explores such complex themes as being in high school. (laughs) Uh, That's not an overall judgment call, I swear, even if the tone is a bit judgmental, but it's kind of like going and seeing a poignant independent movie that made you contemplate the mysteries of the universe, and then going to see The Fast and the Furious immediately after. Human beings are complex creatures who can enjoy both, but it's not really a level playing field. And to be honest, in this instance, I'm actually less interested in a well-formed art piece of a game than I am in the mass-marketed, simple version of it. I mentioned at the beginning of this that I was kind of surprised that people had downloaded these mobile games at all, let alone that they had like a fandom. Uh, And this is partially because the ads themselves were so outlandish, and partially because I was kind of vaguely aware of the Japanese concept of visual novels. Uh, See, I have been on the internet for too long, (laughs) 
which means that my brain is just a horrible little sponge to absorb content whether I want to or not. In a Tumblr setting, that means just seeing some piece of media in GIF format float by in dribs and drabs, and then eventually understanding what the plot is at a base level without ever having to interact with it directly. Which is how I know about Dramatical Murder, a Japanese visual novel that was first released in 2012. Dramatical Murder is an unrepentantly horny sci-fi novel in which you play as a blue-haired twink and you sort of stumble around while other twinks, twunks and muscle boys with swords try and hit it. And you say, but I'm not gay, a lot. And then one of the endings lets you, like, fuck a male robot while his battery dies. Or, like, he dies. I think maybe he sacrificed himself to save you. Either way, you can definitely smash if you click the right button. <laughs> As an aside, I was trying to remember the name of this thing to write this episode and allow me to give you some insight into the thought process that it took for me to finally get to dramatical murder. Uh, This is what I googled to remember the title. Japanese sci-fi game with jellyfish. Japanese sci-fi game with jellyfish erotic? Japanese sci-fi game blue hair boy. And finally, Japanese visual novel guy piercings blue hair? The last one was the, the one that did it. Uh, Point is, I don't get it, but I do understand the prominence of Japanese media in the US market. At one point in the 90s, anime was a bigger Japanese export to the US than steel. Uh, It's still a booming market with a pretty loyal fan base, so I was kind of confused as to why people would go for a Western version when the Japanese one was already there and pretty popular. But I think that's maybe what the marketing got right. The ads were outrageous and kind of oddly sexual a lot of the time. And they featured really prominently on Tumblr and Instagram, which are two platforms that are really popular with young women. The audience on Tumblr is likely to be familiar with the Japanese iteration of visual novels on some level simply because of the nature of the platform and the active anime and manga fandoms that are contained therein. So they made ads that explained the game mechanics simply enough for new users, but also acknowledged the outrageous and sexy potential of visual novels in a way that nodded to some of the more hardcore erotic content that could be found in some of the Japanese games. One of the few articles that I was able to find about the rise to prominence of visual novels in the mobile space was about the fact that they had a reasonably large Tumblr fandom. Writing for Polygon in 2018, Petrana Radulovic discusses the popularity of Choices, which I've previously mentioned, and two other visual novels called The Arcana and Mystic Messenger. She says, They're primarily geared toward women. That's not to say that men don't play them, but in the video game space where having a default female main character is still not common, Choices, The Arcana, and Mystic Messenger stand out for their feminine perspectives. The demographic of people who play these mobile visual novels are young women who enthusiastically post about these games, create fan art based on original and favourite characters, and write fan fiction. So the fact that there is such a significant fandom for these games makes sense. The marketing team for Choices understood their audience and were able to get their attention in an environment that not only mattered to them but encouraged their continued engagement. These are games with the potential to tap into a significant female audience. Women make up nearly half of mobile gamers and are more likely to choose mobile games over other platforms. They're also less likely to self-identify as gamers. So visual novels are kind of perfect because they tap into the mobile medium, but they explicitly center women in their storytelling and visuals. They also allow the kind of character customization and fantasy that really appeals to marginalized populations, which would also go some way to explaining their ongoing popularity. Look, I'm not a gamer in any sense of the word, and I'm not about to go out and download a visual novel game, not even a horny one, but I do feel like I learned some things while researching this, uh, which is what I wanted to do. Do I understand the desire to romance 15 cartoon characters at a time and still only end up getting to boink one of them? No. Do I support your right to do so on a bus like a little pervert? Absolutely.
Well, that's the end of that one. <laughs> uh, what an adventure. I cannot believe that I had to try and remember what Dramatical Murder was. And then I still didn't have time to talk about Hatterful Boyfriend, which is a game where you romance pigeons and then the pigeons become your boyfriend. But also there are nuclear weapons involved. Uh, <laughs> so if you want to know about that one, hit me up next time you see me at the pub. Peace.